The last two or three years have been the most exciting in cancer research history. When I came to Penn in 1974, I was the only medical oncologist in the whole hospital. Cancer was a death sentence for the vast majority of people. Today, cancer in many forms is a very curable disease. We cure more than 80% of breast cancer, more than 95% of testicular cancer, and it goes on and on. The Abrams and Cancer Center offers patients the best in standard of care treatment, but also offers patients hope. And this hope is really driven by some very exciting translational research. We have begun to unravel the genetics or the genomics of each individual cancer that allow us to specifically target a drug to that patient's abnormality in their genetic code. To attack their cancer using their own blood cells, this has led to unprecedented cures in patients with acute lymphoblastic leukemia who would have had no hope left at all. One of Penn's most famous researchers is Dr. Carl June, the pioneer in immunotherapy. He was recruited to Penn solely through the philanthropy of the Abramson Cancer Center. The federal government, the National Cancer Institute, would not fund his research because it was too risky, too far out. And finally, when he published his breakthrough work, the NIH came to him and wanted to give him money based on Dr. Carl June and David Porter's pioneering work in the immunotherapy of acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Dr. Steve Schuster at Penn has translated this CART-19 therapy into a new treatment for patients with refractory, diffuse, large B-cell non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. These are patients who failed chemotherapy, have failed bone marrow transplant, have no hope left. 50% of those patients achieve a complete remission. This has really revolutionized the way that we at Penn treat patients with acute leukemia, but also the way the community at large in oncology approaches patients with acute leukemia. This is actually a real case. Parents of a young child coming to a Penn and CHOP with a child who now has no other option with acute leukemia, basically getting blood transfusions, giving a prognosis of several weeks. And so the child came along and was enrolled in our CART cell therapy. Her T cells, these are the white cells, are taken out of her blood in small amounts and then engineered by genetic engineering to arm these T cells so that they can kill cancer cells and then infuse it back into the child. And my cell phone rang. He looked like he was in a daze and he was just staring at his phone. And I said, what's wrong? There must be something wrong. And he said, no, the T-cells worked. He said, she's in remission. This is a child who had a prognosis of several weeks. He's back in school now five years later. is enjoying life. We've now had hundreds of children, hundreds of children with ALL who will die in, in a few weeks. And they're benefiting from this around the country. I work in the lung cancer world, and the number of new technologies on the radiation side that have grown since I started just two years ago is tremendous. The number of new drugs that have been approved for patients that can then extend their lives and make their lives better, make their symptoms better controlled, has been exponentially growing. We have something now 
that we use routinely called stereotactic radiation, where patients can just come for anywhere from one to five treatments. So it's very easy, in and out in an hour. My cancer is a very rare cancer. I have thymic carcinoma. There's only about 400 new cases every year. When I first met Mr. Miller, by the time that he came to me, he had already been to many hospitals, been through many doctors, and I said, you've been through a lot. One day we were talking about suffering, and I think she asked me some question about whether that frightened me or concerned me. And I said to her, Dr. Berman, I've been a Philadelphia Eagles fan since I'm eight years old. I know suffering. I did 33 days of radiation treatment here at the Abertson Center. I was amazed at the treatment I got and also amazed because there was a list of possible side effects and the way Dr. Berman designed the treatment, I didn't have any. If the way I feel is any window into how I'm doing, I'm doing great. I was appointed several years ago to serve on President Obama's Bioethics Commission, and I'm currently serving on the Precision Medicine IRB for the National Institutes of Health. In November of 2011, I had had my biopsy. I was also at the time experiencing very serious uh, cervical spine pain due to a herniated disc. So I went to work that day to teach a class. I taught the class and I went back to my office and I was literally laying on the floor of my office in tears. I got a call with Dr. Glick and he said to me, Anita, yes you do have breast cancer and I'm going to save your life. I felt that I knew a lot about medicine and healthcare. I knew how to research medical issues. I am a scholar. I believed that everybody had chemo, that everybody had radiation, that everybody uh, faced almost certain death, that you were very lucky if you were one of the few who survived. And the first thought is, I'm going to die and leave my children. All that turned out to be not the reality. I'm very grateful. Now we have clinical trials being designed exactly for early detection of relapsed breast cancer. And in fact, the Philly Fights Cancer's funds that have been raised actually help catalyze it. And this is where I think philanthropy is very important. You invest today for the cures for tomorrow. The Cancer Moonshot Program is an important program because it focuses the nation's attention and the federal government's attention once again on cancer. So what uh, Vice President Joe Biden has done is to look at the cancer research community and see what's the best way to harmonize to get people to work together. And the first place he came to launch the program was Penn. We believe in patient-centered, compassionate, honest, transparent care, coupled with science that is so outstanding that we can produce advances for a patient today where they may not be available at another institution for years. When I went to the Cancer Center for the first time after my diagnosis, Dr. Glick was literally waiting in the waiting room to greet me. When you come to Penn, you really feel like you're being taken care of by your family. If you're sick, you come, we care for you. We are on the journey with you. We'll be there. One of the persons that I will always remember is a woman named Mary. One morning, Mary and I were sitting there together, and I noticed that Mary was crying, and I said, are you okay? And she smiled, and she said, yes. She said, actually, my tears are stupid tears. She said, I have 28 days of radiation treatment, and today is my last day. And I feel like I should be happy because it's my last day but I can't imagine not starting my days with the people that I've been surrounded by for the last four weeks. I feel like I've entered home. It was great, and I, I'm so grateful for everything that I experienced there. Without philanthropy, we would never be able to explore all the promising leads. Today, when an investigator gets a grant approved by the National Cancer Institute, of those approved grants, only 8% are being funded. Without philanthropy, we leave so many important ideas on the table 
that it's a tragedy. What our dream is, is not only to treat your cancers when you come to the door, but to be able to prevent it. And we really are very hopeful that the science will lead us down the path where one day we look back and we said, we made it. We can close down our business and go home.